Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are continuing Magical Month for August, although as I'm looking out of the window, it's probably more of a wet August at the moment. It was raining so hard this morning it actually woke me up. Anyway, last week we looked at Demonology by King James I and we're actually going back in time slightly this week because we're going to have a look at John Dee and... He's basically this absolutely fascinating figure from the Elizabethan period and why he hasn't got a film made about him yet, I really don't know because he's just fascinating. And this particular episode is going to look at a particular incident between him and allegedly the devil in Manchester, but we are going to have a look at a few other things that he was into as well to take into account all the magical stuff that we're looking at. Now, Blur's Damon Albarn actually immortalised him in an opera, Dr. D, so I'd quite like to see some kind of TV series about his exploits or something, because that would be brilliant. But anyway, we shall see. So basically, who was John D? Because if you've never heard of him, you're probably sitting there going, that's all right, I see. Who is he? He was born in 1527, and he became an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. Now, this is quite interesting, because he also worked for Elizabeth's sister, Mary Tudor. And he was her astrologer, astronomer, mathematician and philosopher. So you could see him as being a bit of a polymath. And after Mary died and the throne passed to Elizabeth, the fact he managed to continue working in a similar position, it does show that people place some kind of value on what it was that he he could do for them. Now, being an astrologer, we might go, what? How was that a job? In those days, people actually treated astrology like a science. Some people do now. I know I do realise that. And I'm talking about astrology along the lines of drawing up charts for things. So you might draw up a chart for, say, a coronation to find out when the most auspicious day for that would be. So it's not like looking in the paper and going, ooh, what's going to happen today for Leo? It's much more specific than that. And if you actually go to a website like astro.com, you can get your own birth chart online. It's very, very simple. Anyway, Dee was basically drawing up astrological charts for Elizabeth, but there was actually quite a lot of danger in doing so, because there was an act established in 1581, which actually handed out the death penalty for anybody who was doing prophecies or soothsaying regarding the Queen's reign using occult practices. So the fact that Dee was basically using occult practices and still helping the Queen shows what kind of influence he really held in the royal court. And this is the thing. D was also a magician, and I don't mean that in the sense of being a witch or a cunning man, so he wasn't sort of doing spells and things like that, and obviously nor was he pulling rabbits out of hats. In those days, magicians were far more ceremonial, and they sort of pre- followed prescribed rituals. And Jason Louvre notes that D was literally being a scientist in these endeavours. Now, we think of science and go, ooh, I've run an experiment, or ooh, I've tested a theory. And you come up with an idea about like the world or the universe and then you find some means of testing to see if you're right or not. Back in Dee's day, science was looking backwards instead of forwards. They were trying to rediscover all of the knowledge that was lost during the Dark Ages. So basically the point was you would keep working your way back through time using these magical methods to uncover this knowledge and eventually you would work your way back to God himself and you'd be getting your wisdom from the original source. So it's still seeking knowledge, just in a very different way. Obviously, there is a sense of scepticism towards this approach nowadays, because obviously we would rather use something like a Large Hadron Collider, but this is obviously going back 500 years. Jason Louv also points out that a lot of biographers tend to skim over a lot of Dee's occult work, or they're quite disdainful of it, perhaps to preserve their own reputation, much like people don't like to talk about Isaac Newton's attempts at alchemy. But then other writers have kind of taken his day's work with angels and really romanticised it. Or they look at it with like a new age kind of mysticism lens and that's not right either. Because Dee's actually more important than, than either of those approaches. Because the idea of a spiritual dimension populated by good and bad spirits was actually really common in his day. But the communication with it was restricted to the church. 
So obviously the only people who could really intercede would be things like priests. But if you were a cunning man, a magician, or even just a scryer, and these people were a little bit like sort of modern day TV psychics, they were not allowed to engage with this realm. And the fact that Dee did so, and remained on exceptionally good terms with Elizabeth I, is testament both to his tenacity and the fact that he did all of his occult stuff as a scientist. So because of the rigour that he applied to everything, I mean he documented everything, it sort of elevates him slightly beyond merely messing about, if that makes sense. Now, to be fair, he did end up getting in prison for heresy in 1555, and some people think he was actually the inspiration for Prospero in The Tempest. But while we're talking about his occult work, we really also have to introduce his assistant, Edward Kelly. Now, this was a highly unstable man who basically turned up on his doorstep and claimed to be a medium. He was actually fired at one point because they realised he was lying, but for some reason he ended up worming his way back in again. And... Basically, Dee and Kelly spent seven years between 1582 and 1589 apparently conversing with angels. And what would happen is Dee would be in one room asking the questions and Kelly would be in another room apparently channeling the angels and letting that the angels speak through them. And if you believe Kelly, and there's plenty of reason not to, the angels passed on the, the original language that mankind spoke before the fall of man. And they also gave the pair this really complicated math system, which would mean that they could communicate with the angels again in future. And in Jason Louis' book, he explains that this particular system later influences people like the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, and also Alistair Crowley. I should point out that Kelly also claimed the angels told him and Dee that they should share their wives. And according to Dee's biographers, Kelly had always had a bit of a thing for Dee's wife. She didn't return the interest, so I don't think she was particularly impressed with it, and Dee reluctantly went along with it. But if this doesn't paint Kelly as a cunning opportunistic charlatan, I really don't know what does. But anyway, Dee basically headed off to Europe, and he was even dispensing advice to Rudolph II over in Bohemia. Some people think he was working as a spy for Elizabeth, and if those rumours are to be believed, his codename was actually, and I kid you not, 007. He was so desperate to be taken seriously for what he thought he could do and he was absolutely desperate to be appointed court astrologer. Lots of other courts around Europe had them. Elizabeth, while she liked even studying with them and they would do a lot of occult work together, basically she wasn't going to appoint him. So if, if she wasn't going to make him an astrologer, then he basically assumed that somebody else might. So his trips to Krakow and Prague both look like ill-judged job hunting attempts. But I'm not going to talk too much about what he did while he was over in Europe. I mean, eventually him and Kelly parted ways, thankfully. But while he was away, locals trashed his house. So he came back and found his house was ruined, his books from his library were all over the place, and a lot of his occult equipment had been broken. So the first person Day asks for help is actually Elizabeth I herself, which really does say quite a lot about the status that this quite low-born magician had managed to achieve at the court if he could speak to the queen himself i mean after i think it was after one of his wives died elizabeth actually rocked up at his doorstep to find out how he was because she was passing anyway but still quite impressive that you can ask the queen for help and her solution involved asking the archbishop of canterbury to find him a job and he was hoping he would get a position in winchester which was quite a, an attractive position at the time Instead, the archbishop gave him the post of warden at Manchester Collegiate Church, which was basically putting him as far away from po as possible from Elizabeth. So he's basically completely removed from the court, which shows that he had quite a lot of status with Elizabeth, but he didn't necessarily have that level of status with everybody else. So he eventually moves to Manchester in 1596, and some of his personal belongings can still be found at Chetham's Library in Manchester. And Chetham's Library is actually the oldest public library in Britain, and it dates back to 1653, and it houses over 120,000 books, manuscripts and maps. And the original goal was to create a northern rival to the libraries of Cambridge and Oxford. Both Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels once used its books, and you can actually still see the desk where they worked in the reading room. Now, the library holds five of these books, and one of them is Conrad Gesner's De Remedis Secretis. And this was actually printed in 1555. And Dee wrote Johannes D. 1556 on its title page. And you can see some of the books on the Chetlam's Library's website. So this is where we're going to get into the meat of this episode. I just wanted to give you some background context on who Dee actually was. 
Now, Dee didn't exactly relish the move to Manchester, but he did think that maybe he could continue his occult studies basically in peace and quiet when he's so far away from the court. But people at the Collegiate Church treated him with open hostility, so he basically ended up going back to Mortlake in London in 1605. But this is a bit we're looking at. Some people actually think he summoned the devil while he was in Manchester. Now, this is despite Dee's fascination for angels and his unwavering belief that he could contact them for guidance. And actually, I didn't mention this before, but his aim in talking to angels was actually quite a pretty noble one because he wanted to unify mankind and he thought that learning the language of creation might help. There's also work being done that explains that he was actually attempting to bring about the apocalypse so that mankind could return to the glory of God and get back to the Garden of Eden. And some people, some scholars think that his interest in maths comes from a similar place. It's that trying to understand what goes on beneath the world that we can see. And Deborah Harkness talks about the conversations that Dee had with angels. And they basically show that they represent his attempt to practice natural philosophy. And this was at a time when a lot of people thought nature, time and the world as they knew it were coming to the end anyway. But back to the demonic end of the spectrum. According to this legend... D conjured up Lucifer for his advice. Bearing in mind, obviously, Lucifer is a fallen angel. So, you know, if you're going to talk to angels, you know, why discriminate? And nobody knows what advice old Nick passed on. But many people believe he must have turned up because there's actually a burn mark on a table. And people think that was made by one of his hooves. You can find a table in the audit room at Chatham School. And there are photos of the burn mark online. Unfortunately, due to copyright issues, I haven't got any in my blog post, but you can you can find images on Google. And rumours like this basically fueled the hatred towards Dee. People already didn't like him. If they thought he was conjuring up like the devil in the middle of a library, people would obviously be quite knocked about it. And if that wasn't enough, plague broke out in the city. And that actually killed Dee's beloved wife and two of his seven children. Some sources actually say that he lost four. Either way, he lost his wife and some of his children. So, you know, basically a bit of a horrible time for him. And obviously by the time we get to 1603, Elizabeth I dies. James I comes to the throne. He really just doesn't appreciate anything to do with magic, sorcery, whatever. And he actually denied Dee's request for a transfer. So when Dee returns to London in 1605, it's very much in disgrace and not in this glorious return to Mortlake and his, his home where he'd been happy. I should point out, Parliament passed the first Witchcraft Act in 1542 and that handed the death penalty to basically anyone who was found guilty of practising witchcraft. That was repealed in 1547, and then a new one came in in 1562, which is the one that I mentioned last week, which was basically, you know, you're guilty if you've hurt someone or killed someone with witchcraft, rather than you've practised witchcraft. So it is possible that the two years between the death of Elizabeth I and then his return to London, that Dee basically fell foul of James I's hatred of witches. And obviously we talked about James in demonology last week. Now, the earlier laws only covered dealing with spirits as a crime if it caused actual harm. So that basically would make his attempt to contact angels legal because it didn't involve third parties and it didn't involve injury. It was literally just having a conversation with them. However, the 1604 Act that was passed by James meant that the death penalty basically was around for anyone who invoked evil spirits. Now, you could argue angel magic still wouldn't fall under this bill because obviously who would claim angels as evil spirits but because obviously James had this interest in demonology and there was this idea that really only the church should be contacting spirits both good and bad Dee clearly got quite worried about his status. James ignored all of these petitions and the bill became law and it really is quite a shame that Dee fell from grace during his time both in prison and in Europe because I mean he amassed this absolutely enviable occult library and most of it disappeared during the ransacking of his house so while you can see some of his documents online you do have to wonder how much knowledge did that man actually amass while he was alive. Now Dee also despite being like absolutely fascinating one of my favourite people in English history just in case you hadn't gathered me enthusiasm for him he also caught the eye of the Manchester psychogeographers. And psychogeography is basically this practice of following a route and basically getting to know a city. There's a lot more to it than that. If you want me to do an episode on psychogeography, please drop me a tweet and I'll quite happily do one. But for matters of length and everything. Some people believe that Dee lived on an old street where the Corn Exchange now stands, which isn't really that far from Chetham's Library. 
other people say it was more likely he lived at the college and quite frankly I think that's probably more likely as well but there was a note from D on August 19th 1597 where he said that he received Earl and Countess of Derby at Alport lodging now apparently Alport is actually an old village at the end of Deansgate if you don't know Manchester and I had to look this up that's the opposite end of Deansgate to the Corn Exchange so it's it's possible that he had two homes and he might have had like one at the church and one somewhere else but it's also unlikely that one of them is basically now under the corn exchange but anyway february 1996 the manchester area psychogeographic group were absolutely convinced that the corn exchange was where d's former residence once stood and they decided to levitate the building on the anniversary of his arrival in manchester so they walked anti-clockwise around the corn exchange three times made a public declaration and then waited to see if the building moved. As far as I know, it didn't. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that was supposed to achieve. But it, to be honest with you, it it sort of it stands out for me more because they were so determined to make contact with him or his spirit or just draw attention to the fact that he'd even been in Manchester. You know, it's kind of saying, yes, this amazing figure who's fascinating and has somehow ended up being relegated to sort of the shadows of history. He was here. And I think that is the hold that John Dee still has on the creative imagination of artists and writers. Lots of people focus on his time as the advisor to Elizabeth I. Other people look at his angelic communications. He's even the subject of an artistic conspiracy. And there's a painting on my blog post for this episode, which is www.icsedgwick.com forward slash John hyphen D, where he's basically doing an experiment for Elizabeth I. And in the original image, there was actually a ring of skulls surrounding him on the floor. And they've basically been painted out. And some people think it was basically an airbrushing to return him to the position of sort of court advisor and not a cult magician instead. Now, it is unlikely that he conjured the devil in Manchester. But the fact that the story persists and that 400 years later, a group of psychogeographers might try to contact his spirit basically shows how enduring his legend is. And I think he's an absolute fantastic figure. If you find him as fascinating as I do, or you just want to learn more about him, I really recommend a book by Benjamin Woollett called The Queen's Conjurer. And there's a link to that on my blog post as well. It's absolutely brilliant. Like I, I think I read it in about two days because I got it for Christmas. It was so good. Other than that, though, we have two weeks left in magical month i'm still taking requests for topics so please feel free to tweet me at ac sedgwick or drop me an email or whatever and that'll be brilliant i'm also planning additional bonuses for anyone who becomes a patron on patreon at the moment it's looking like i'm going to actually put in two because of the two options in my poll that are both doing quite well so watch this space there is more stuff coming but this has gone on a little bit longer than I would have liked because I could talk about John Dee all day because he's so interesting otherwise have an absolutely fantastic week ahead and I will see you next week cheerio thank you for listening to this week's episode I hope that you enjoyed it if you did feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com, and that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images, and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead, and I'll see you soon. Cheerio!